And pleased to have with us the Secretary of the Florida Department of Corrections. It's the third largest such department in the nation. Secretary Ricky Dixon with us. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, Preston. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I, I'm, I confess to being a little frustrated watching the campaign for Amendment 3. Uh, while I think there is some good pushback happening, which oftentimes doesn't take place, I, I still believe that the disinformation, and I do believe some of it is disinformation, and the misinformation is problematic. From your chair, what do you see when you see this campaign unfold? First of all, I appreciate you having me on and giving me the chance to kind of set the record straight here because I'm, I'm frustrated as well. I'm not surprised when I hear misinformation by various media outlets, especially when there's motivation to um, – to pass something such as Amendment 3, but it does get frustrating when the misinformation is so prevalent and uh, doesn't even seem to be accidental in some cases, but absolutely disingenuous. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to um, just provide some clarity, and I'll be as clear as I can be. There, there's a, a myth out there that our prison is full of inmates uh, for simply uh, smoking marijuana. Um, so if you want to talk about inmates in our prison system for smoking marijuana, there's nothing to talk about. If you want to talk about inmates in our system because of smoking marijuana and because of the impacts that, that starting with marijuana, uh, committing crimes under the influence, committing crimes to continue um, their drug habits or, uh, or the, the drug use that, that was predicated upon the use of marijuana and led to, to uh, higher level drugs, there, there's a great deal to talk about. So um, as you know, Preston, we've got a very comprehensive data and research arm here in the department, and we had them do some homework and uh, just, just to see what the facts are. And what we found was there are actually only 37 individuals. Today we've got 87,552 individuals in our custody, and we found that there are only 37 that are in our custody right now for the primary or secondary or, or tertiary offenses of, of, of marijuana possession. Now, that's over 20 grams, and what's interesting about that is those 37 are not in our system uh, strictly for that charge, but their sentences were enhanced by either an, an extensive criminal record or severe accompanying crimes like grand theft, battery, child abuse, uh, possession of other illicit substances, and so on and so on. So, um, so Preston, that's the facts as it relates to uh, those in our prison system for marijuana use. So you mean there's not even one person that is in our prison system solely because they possessed a little bit of marijuana? They not were... even not even one person. Yeah, and uh, I, I guess I guess from a personal a little bit of a personal experience that I'll I'll share with you what really frustrates me is I I, I know the impact. I'm not a political figure. I'm not I'm not a, involved in scientific studies, but I've been doing this for almost three decades now. And I have literally talked to thousands of inmates in, in my career, um, both those with, with low-level, uh, a few years on their sentence, up to life, and, and in fact, up to including conversations moments before someone's death as a result of the death penalty. And there's a common theme that I hear, and it is the regret of the association with their drug use, often, most often starting with marijuana, uh, that led to their subsequent life in, in prison or, or prison sentence. It's just such a common theme among those that, that I've talked to, again, for almost three decades now. Secretary, I have, I've been sort of on the other side of that in the sense that I've talked to men and women that, that were going through drug rehabilitation programs going back to the mid-1980s, and I heard from every single one of them that for them the gateway was marijuana. I understand that alcohol is a gateway to bigger things as well, but marijuana absolutely positively is a gateway drug, and, and the numbers inside your prison system verify that, don't they? Well, they, they do, and let me add to that. The, the co-occurring impact of, of marijuana use and mental health um, cases in our system, and I, I'm not crazy about it, but we are, in fact, the de facto mental health um, organizations of our day across the country. We, we have a lot of mental health cases in our, in our system. In fact, 58% of those in our custody right now need some sort of substance use uh, treatment. Over 24% are identified with mental health needs. So the association of drug use and, and, and the mental health um, you know, needs that we have to meet in our system is is, is difficult, and it's a uh, 
it, it's, it, it is so frustrating because it almost reverses all the hard work we've been doing. You know, right now, many people may not know this, but we've got a 21% uh, recidivism rate. That's one of the best recidivism rates in the country. And, and that means that folks that get out of our prison, only 21% come back to prison within three years. That's something to be very, very proud of. We've worked very hard to, uh, under the Governor DeSantis' leadership to, to get down to that level. And that's because of treatment and programs and all of the things we do to, um, to, to better the success of those getting out of our system and to, to reduce victimization once they're out and back on the street. And um, it just feels like a reversal of all that hard work. And, uh, and I know it, and the people that work in this profession knows it as well. Florida Department of Corrections Secretary Ricky Dixon with us for a few more minutes. Secretary, stand by. 40 past the hour. It's the morning show with Preston Scott on News Radio 100.7 WFLA or on News Radio WFLA Panama City.com. A few more minutes with Secretary of Corrections, Ricky Dixon. Mr. Secretary, got a caller that feels like uh, you and I are being disingenuous, perhaps, for not distinguishing the difference between prisons and jails, suggesting that perhaps there are people sitting in jail for singular possession use. Um, you want to address that? Because I'd be happy to. <laughs> sure. Sure, there, there is a distinction between prison and jail, and uh, as you know, the, the sentence of a year and a day and, uh, results in you, in you going to prison. Um, I, I don't know jail, st- the jail statistics uh, that well. I concentrate more on the prison statistics, but what I do know from uh, conversations with numerous sheriffs across our state is it, it's kind of similar, even though there, there may be some initial arrests or citations for marijuana use, it usually results in an appearance before a judge and a, and a pretty immediate release. And unless they're accompanying cr- crimes, so right. the same within the jails, it doesn't normally end up, you know, in and of itself, possession of marijuana or smoking marijuana doesn't usually result in extensive jail sentences. Well, and the state is also pointing out on a totally different level here or a different part of the problem that right now one in four fatalities involves somebody smoking weed. Can you even project what you might face inside the prison system? If if we make this legal, recreational use, it will find its way into the hands of young adults, minors, and and we're now going to change the entire trajectory of their lives because of their access to it. Yeah, I, I think uh, my my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Eric Hall with DJJ, can can speak a lot to that. We we've talked about the impact it has on the youth, but as it relates to the to the adult prison system, I can tell you if this passes. We will start preparations for an uh, an increase in the prison population and the cost that goes along with that. So any you know any touting of those that are for Amendment Three and the, the, any of those that would talk about the tax revenue it generates, I would argue it will be off, offset two two to four times by the social cost, the the prison cost. Not not to mention the human um, uh, you know impacts. I think a lot of people that vote for this may have not all, but may have uh, some self-serving desire, want to access it, but when you think about, as uh, as I just heard Sheriff Grady Judge speaking the other day so, so well, it doesn't matter until it matters, and I think some people will second-guess their initial opinions, initial opinions when they recognize the loss of life that occurs on our highways um, and, and just some of the, the impacts that passing this would have on our, our state. Is there any way to quantify the number of men and women that are in the Florida State prison system that had some form of marijuana use in their background? Anecdotally, uh, in my speaking with him over the years, it, it is extremely prevalent. I don't, I don't know a percentage. I can tell you there's a 58%, as I mentioned earlier, substance use treatment need right now in our system, and, and much of those are, are related to either marijuana or marijuana as a gateway drug, as you mentioned earlier. Secretary Dixon, thanks so much for the time today. I appreciate it very much. Thank you again, Preston, for the opportunity. You take care. All righty. Florida Corrections Secretary Ricky Dixon with us this morning on the morning show with Preston Scott. And again, just add it to the list. You know, that that's a great point he made at the end there as it relates to cost. One of the ads is talking about, look at the benefit it'll be to the Florida you know, the, the economy of Florida. Now look at the cost.